Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our online service this Sunday afternoon. As you mentioned last week, our online services for the month of August are going to look a little bit different. Uh, we're inviting some guest preachers to come and join us. It was wonderful last week to welcome uh, George Crowder, a minister of a church in Winsford in the northwest of England. And George is back with us again this week and he's going to be preaching through the next little bit of Matthew chapter 14. Um, so it's great to have George back with us again. Um, all you need to follow along our service this afternoon is one of these sheets uh, outlined for household worship. And you can download that from the church website, www.swanlandbarchurches.com. Um, but if you don't, are not able to do that, you're more than welcome to join us. And we'll make things as clear as possible as we go through. Uh, also, yeah, it would be great if you have a copy of the Bible. Uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 14. Maybe you want to stick a finger in there. Uh, also, our psalm this afternoon is Psalm 109. And we're going to be saying that together as a prayer and a praise to God. Well, it's so great you could join us. Let me read a couple words from one of the psalms uh, before we begin. Let's read. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Those pictures of the waves roaring is a picture of chaos. And we live in a world, don't we, that is, feels so often out of control, feels chaotic. The current pandemic we're living through has thrown everything up into the air. Maybe there's things in your life that just feel out of control. Well, the wonderful news of Sam is, is they might be out of our control, but they're not out of God's. And if we belong to him, his might is working on our behalf, which is wonderful news. Let's be quiet for a moment and pray as we begin our time together. The Lord on high is mighty. Father, we praise you that you are the mighty God. Thank you that as we gather together in our homes in front of screens, we know it's not the same, but we thank you that you are the God who is mighty, who is in control. Though this world so often feels out of control, thank you that you are in control. You are mightier than the mightiest forces of chaos. Please would you deepen our faith in you, deepen our faith in Christ through these next few minutes together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to come now to our confession, and we're going to ask God to forgive us our sins. It's, it's right as we gather together to acknowledge that we've not been the people we want to be, let alone the people God wants us to be. And we ask him for his forgiveness as we begin this time together. Let me read some words from uh, one of the letters in the New Testament from John's first letter. John says this, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a wonderful promise. It's so easy, isn't it, with our wrongs, the things we feel guilty about, the things we know are wrong, to kind of try and sweep them under the carpet. Well, this verse says we're only deceiving ourselves. God sees our hearts. He sees what we're hiding away. We often don't fool others. We're only deceiving ourselves. But instead, there's great freedom when we come to God, admitting our sins openly and asking for his forgiveness. And so let's take a moment of quiet. Perhaps there's things in the last week that you've been burdened by, uh, that feeling of guilt you know are wrong. Bring them now before the Lord and we're going to confess our sins together. But a moment of quiet first. Well, let's confess our sins to God, our Father, together. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life 
to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful news of that verse is that God does forgive. He is faithful and just. He's faithful because he's promised it. He is just because Jesus has taken the punishment in our place to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me pray this prayer. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to turn now from confession of sin to praise. That's where once we know the forgiveness of sins, we ought to be a people who are break forth in praise to God. And we're going to use the words of Psalm 109 to praise God together. Let's say together Psalm 109. I'll give you a moment to, to find it, to turn it up in your Bibles. It's a psalm of David. David was in trouble, uh, enemies uh, around him. But also, towards the end, he knows that he will praise God for his great deliverance. It's a song that Jesus sings. See if you can spot the echoes as we say this together of Jesus' experience. Let's stand, wherever you are, why not stand with me as we say together this psalm. It's a psalm of David, beginning verse 1. Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few, may another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any pity to his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy, and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse, let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing, may it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat, may it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around him, like a belt that he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, of those who speak evil against my life. But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake. Because your steadfast love is good, deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a shadow at evening. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servant will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a cloak. With my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng, for he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. This is God's word. It's a wonderful final verse, isn't it? The Lord stands at the right hand of the needy one. If we are in Christ, if we recognize our need of him, he stands at our right hand to save us from those who would condemn us. Ultimately, the devil who would accuse us and condemn us. Christ stands at our right hand to 
save us and deliver us. Well, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading. If you've got a Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 14. And last week we looked at verses 13 to 21. We're going to look at the next little passage now as we turn to verse 22. So Matthew chapter 14, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. I wonder if you've got a Bible, uh, turn that up. I'll give you a moment to, to find it now. Well, let's read. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. And now this is what happens straight away afterwards. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we praise God for his word in response to his word. We're going to stand and show that we praise him for his word by declaring that we believe what it says. We're going to stand and declare the truths of the creed, truths that Christians have held tightly to all down through the centuries, been willing to die for through the centuries. And we join in their confession. So why not stand with me, wherever you are, as we say together the creed beginning, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go now over to George. Well, hello. Let's pray. Father, as we learn from Jesus today, help us with our fears and our doubts. Help us to trust in Jesus more. Amen. Well, the picture of Jesus walking on water is one of those enduring images that everyone loves. It's an iconic moment. This is a green basilisk, commonly known as a Jesus lizard. It can walk, or rather run, on water, hence it got the name. Walking on water is an idea that fascinates. I don't think many people know what to make of it, but it looks great. One reaction is to try to do it by some means. Isn't that what surfing is all about? And there are some marvellous inventions as well. 
The idea of walking on water has captured our imagination, but we tend to respond in, in quite a silly way, don't we? The disciples were confronted by the one who really could walk on water, the Son of God. How did they respond? In short, badly. They responded first with fear and then with doubt. But Jesus taught them some lessons about being his disciples and these are lessons that we can learn from too, about how we should respond to the Son of God. And he says, do not fear, do not doubt. The power of the Son of God is available to all. So first, let's think about that first thing, do not fear. Verses 22 to 27. Jesus dismissed the crowd, sent his disciples off fishing and went to pray alone. Meanwhile, the weather is getting increasingly worse on the lake. Look at verse 24. The boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It's the fourth watch of the night, which is between three o'clock and six o'clock in the morning. And uh, oh, the men are going to be tired and dispirited. The grey light of morning just filtering through the mist and the spray. And then their hollow eyes fix on a strange sight. There's a figure walking towards them, walking on the waves. Jesus came to them walking on the sea. If you look at verse 26, it doesn't say whether they recognised him or not. They just maybe thought he was some sort of ghost. And they were terrified. Jesus had calmed a storm. he just done an amazing thing with some bread and fish. And he implied that he was going to catch up with them. Who else could it be? And who better? That they should be relieved. But, but they aren't tuned in. They're, they're, they're predisposed to fear rather than trust in the power of Christ. Jesus says, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Faith, not fear, is the right response to Jesus. Faith in him, faith in, in his power to save us, faith in his love to be willing to save us. And this is a moment of revelation, a glorious moment. Christ comes to be with his disciples. He comes to dispel their fear. And fear can be a barrier. As lockdown restrictions are lifted, will you venture out into those public places? Will you send your children to school? Will you travel? That's fear. And do we entertain fear that becomes a barrier to seeing Jesus? Does our faith, fear, fear uh, displace our faith in Christ? What fe fears stop you from seeing Christ? Maybe it isn't the ghosts of the dead, but the ghosts of the living. Fear of what others think of you. Their spirits sit in the front stalls of your self-esteem like a fiendish panel of X-Factor judges. You can't see Jesus who loves you, who died for you, because you're lost in a fog of worry about being valued and appreciated by your critical cohort of contemporaries. You fear their judgment, you long for their approval. You've made them unknowing idols, passive worship targets, silent stakeholders in your ambitions, unwitting masters of your worldview. And if I'm describing this problem accurately, it's because I know the territory all too well in my own life. Jesus says, do not fear. Do not fear the ghosts of others. Do not fear anything. Do not fear the curse of ill health. Do not fear the loss of material wealth. Do not fear the threats of evil people. Do not fear uncertainty. Do not fear change. Do not fear rejection. Do not fear loneliness. Do not fear suffering. Do not fear pain. Do not fear death. Jesus has the answer to the sum of all fears. He has an answer to death. He stands over the deep and is not drawn down into it. Take courage. Jesus is here. Do not fear. He knows your name. If you're living for him now, you'll be living with him forever. Do not fear. Or well, second, do not doubt, verses 28 to 33. 
Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, verse 28, tell me to come to you on the water. I think this is a response of a follower of Jesus who wants to join in with him, doing his miraculous works. Jesus has been encouraging that in chapter 10 and even in the recent feeding miracle. So Jesus says, come. And Peter is over the side, tottering over the surging peaks and troughs towards Jesus. And then it all goes a bit wrong, verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and, and, and cried out, Lord, save me. Peter started to doubt. He was being held up by nothing other than Jesus' power. His senses suddenly tune into his surroundings, the, the howling gale, the raging sea. His faith in Christ vaporises and his body is plunged into the water. And he screams for help. Well, he still has faith in Christ to save him. Jesus responded immediately. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And Peter's experience is an excellent picture of doubt. Jesus is there with demonstrable power over the wind and the waves, standing on the water without sinking. But Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and starts to focus on the wind. Our life in Christ is sustained by God's grace. We're like Peter on the waves. Jesus holds us up miraculously. We have no way to God without him. We have no hope beyond this world without the cross. We have no future in eternity without the resurrection. Without faith, we sink into doubt and hopelessness. But you know, we can all struggle with doubt from time to time. What makes us doubt? What takes our focus off Jesus? What seems more credible and believable than the Lord of glory? So we reject our hope in him. Or perhaps the storms of life hollow out, hollow out um, gaps of uncertainty. A breakdown of a relationship with parents, with a brother or sister, with a husband or wife. And the greater part of our identity as a Christian seems to have been eroded away because we were in a Christian family, we were in a Christian couple. Or what about if the person who led you to Christ falls away? I've seen that happen to people. Or what about if the church lets you down? Guilt can be a real catalyst to doubt, can't it? How can we be sure of our faith when we face up to our continuing failures? Personal tragedy can leave us cold with despair. Grief, loss, illness. Where is God? It could actually be something positive rather than negative. Have you ever met someone who says, oh, oh, I've grown out of Christian faith. It offered something once, but now I've moved on. I, I just want to focus on my career or my family. But I know that some Christians just get waves of doubt. And it can be a lonely struggle. You have to put on a face for your friends from church, your parents or your children. You feel ashamed, you feel like a fraud. Well, it is not unusual. What should we do then when, when we feel doubt? Well, the answer is on the way is with Peter. Keep our eyes on Jesus. I love taking people out to do my favourite thing, which is rock climbing. Uh, one thing that they have to do with this activity is to trust me. We're all jo chatty and jolly, yomping up the hill to the outcrop, but very soon... They put their lives into my hands. Uh, it's my experience that almost everyone is all right climbing up. It's when it comes to abseiling back down that things get interesting. If they look around or more likely look down and uh, feel very, very exposed and decide to stop listening to me and act impulsively. And what do I need to do? I need to reform the relationship with me and to build their trust in order to get them down. Because unless they trust me, they'll just keep doing daft things or, or just refuse to budge. I think doubt is like this. It's not merely perceptional, it's relational. 
It's not about how things look. It's about in whom we trust. If we are struggling with doubt, we need to look to Jesus. We need to work on a relationship with Jesus. How do we relate to Jesus? Well, through his word and through his body, the church, through his people. I can tell you that nothing encourages my faith more than hearing about people becoming Christians or hearing about people's experience as Christians in their lives. If you have that sinking feeling, a really simple thing to do is to get a Christian friend around and just ask them about their Christian story and then we'll share yours and then share what's going on for you. It's a great place to start. The Son of God has come into the world. When Jesus gets into the boat, the storm ceases and the disciples worship him. Uh, and for the first time, they declare, verse 33, Truly you are the Son of God. Jesus is with them. Their fear has allayed. Their faithful, faithlessness has attenuated. Their doubt is curtailed. Jesus really is the Son of God. Do not fear. Do not doubt. Thirdly, the power of the Son of God is available to all. Verses 34 to 36. They get over to the other side. Jesus is recognised instantly. Oh, here is the powerful Jesus Christ. Word goes out to the villages and the farms and, and people come in droves. And look at the end of verse 35. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. It's Jesus for all. Easy access Messiah. The point is, Jesus came to the world to bring everyone access to his saving power. Everyone who believes in him. He really is the Son of God. He could walk on water. He can separate us from our sins and bring us life forever with our Father in heaven. Have faith in him. Do not fear. Do not doubt. The power of the Son of God is available for all. Well, let's pray. Father, strengthen our faith in our powerful and loving Saviour, Jesus Christ, so that, Lord, we are lifted up when we are sinking into fear or doubt. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, George, thank you so much for that. Such an encouragement to hear those words. And we're going to continue as we pray together. We're going to respond to hearing God's word preached and read by praying and come into the Lord in faith. We're going to begin with the words of the Lord's Prayer. They're on our sheets, or if you're following in the prayer books at home, page 112, let's pray together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And over the page on the back page, we're going to pray together uh, these prayers, these written prayers. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. And in all things, guide us to know and to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us, that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue in prayer, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great faithfulness. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who truly is, as the disciples recognize, the Son of God, the one who is truly God become man. Thank you for him who is mightier 
and the mightiest waves. Father, we thank you for him who promises to hear the prayers of his people. And so we bring our prayers, we bring our needs before you now. Father, we thank you for your great faithfulness through these last few months. We thank you for the many ways in which you've preserved us. We thank you for the technologies that have allowed us to be able to continue to, in some way, meet together. In some way, keep in touch and sit together under your word, even if it's not the same as face to face. We thank you for these technologies that have allowed us to continue to sit under your word together. Father, we thank you for the reopening of our church buildings. We thank you for how restrictions have allowed for that to happen and for us to be back physically physically together, encouraging one another together. And Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Father, we pray for our health services. We know that they've been under so much pressure over the last while. We thank you for those who have put their lives at risk and their health at risk to serve others. Father, we thank you for their sacrifice. Father, please continue to uphold and sustain them as the pressures haven't fully gone away. Father, please, would you give them the wisdom they need in those difficult decisions? Please, would you give them the energy they need when exhausted by the pressures of medical care? Father, we pray that they would look to you for the resources they do not have within themselves. Please, that they realize that they need the Lord Jesus as they care for others. They need his care for them. Father, please, with this time of difficulty, be lifting their eyes to him to find their hope and their strength in him. We also pray, Father, for those caring for the elderly in nursing homes. We know so many of them have been particularly vulnerable through these last days, and there have been many difficult times in various nursing homes. Father, we pray for the staff of nursing homes. Please uphold them, sustain them. And we pray for those residents, for those who are most vulnerable in this pandemic. Please, would you protect them? We pray that you might restrain the spread of this virus, that it would not spread anymore into these homes. Father, we pray for families who have been so impacted by not being able to see their loved ones in a way that they would have wished. They've been kept at a distance in the most difficult of times from their loved ones. Father, please, would you continue to sustain them? Would they learn to trust you through these difficult times? And Father, we continue to pray for our country through these times. Father, we know that ultimately our only hope in life and death is the Lord Jesus. And yet there are so many in our land that do not know him, that are without Christ, and without hope in this world, and without hope for the eternity to come. Father, please have mercy. Please raise up more missionaries and evangelists and churches that reach out with the good news of the Lord Jesus, to proclaim him, to make him known. Father, please, would you be reviving your church in this land, that through these days of pandemic, people be awakened to the deep need of the Lord Jesus, and your church will be going out joyfully proclaiming him as our only hope in life and death, the one who alone has triumphed over death and sin and hell. Father, we pray for those within our own church family in particular need at the moment. For those whose circumstances are more under the pressure. For those with loved ones in nursing homes they can't see. For those who are ill. Those who are struggling. Father, please, would you keep their eyes looking to Christ. Please surround them with the comfort and the care they need from family and church family. 
But above all, Father, please would you keep them close to you. So, Father, we thank you that you are a God who hears the prayers of your people. And we ask all these things in the precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. We're going to pray a final prayer in a moment. Um, there are hymns uh, available on the, the web page for this um, online service. Um, and if you click on the links, you can sing along a, a singable version on YouTube uh, to sing along at home or wherever you are. Um, so do make use of those. There's lots more resources on the website, so do have a look out for them. But it's been great that you've been able to join us. I'm going to pray a final prayer as we close this time together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together to encourage one another in this way. Father, we pray for each one of us, wherever we are in our homes, that we would find joy and delight in the Lord Jesus and look to him and to him alone as our only hope in life and death. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back again next Sunday at four o'clock. We've got another um, special guest coming to preach for us, um, a retired bishop. He's an Irishman, um, but living over in the UK. And we're looking forward to welcoming him next week, a retired bishop. Uh, but so great having you with us, and we'll speak to you again very soon. Take care. <laughs>